everybody. Welcome to the workstation. Uh, we did this a couple years ago at the LA Forum and a similar thing. I thought it was really nice having everybody uh, up close and I like, can sort of demonstrate what goes into the performance and what all the little toys are made out of, how the drum kits evolved even uh, since that time. Basic changes I made. Uh, this time we went into uh, start the Rolling Bones record. I decided that maybe I was taking it a bit safe and I wanted to change a few things around. So Larry was setting stuff up. I said, hey, wait a minute. Let's Let's move some stuff around. So uh, I put all the tones in different places and move my floor tom over onto the left side. And so then if I did go to any, to any of my state usual patterns, at least they would sound different. And also it gave me a lot of different uh, rhythmic variations, having a low note under the left hand and different pitches available in different different areas. So as, as we go through the songs, what I've done, I just took a live tape from the other night in Reno. And I'm going to pump it through the monitors and play along with it and uh, kind of explain what what each song is made up both musically and technologically and kind of what I'm having to deal with out here in terms of challenge. And one of the first ones is a song called Time Stand Still from a few years ago. And this one lie I'm having to work through a click track because of the female vocalist on it, Amy Mann. And uh, obviously she's not free to travel with us all the time. So we have her up on the screen and in order to keep the song in sync so that when she comes up there singing, she's actually singing to the audience as well. I'm playing with a click track through that. And then uh, apart from the uh, acoustic stuff, I've got a, kind of an array of samples, which is, uh, yeah, it's work. this little sit here is a handy little trigger that uh, we invented and had made, it's like a miniature Simmons pad, it gives me access to an electronic trigger right in the middle of things, instead of all the electronic pads are mostly difficult to get to, and sometimes if you have to stretch too far, it can put you off your, uh, your tempo and smooth and stuff, so something can be put combination, have a little block down there, and then a sheet of metal up there, and uh, different parts of it, you know, castanets over there, and uh, a weirded out snare, and then we're also, just to um, for seeing a three-piece, we use a lot of keyboards and a lot of stuff on uh, our records, it's difficult to reproduce. Well, the other guys are so busy with foot pedals and choreographing all their moves, because one of our points about sampling is that nothing, ha nothing can come from off stage. Anything that gets triggered is triggered by us in real time, so that we're the ones that have to get it in time, and I have to set up the tempo sometimes. Two minutes into a song, a sequencer will come in, the sequencer in perfect tempo, so I'm responsible really to keep the song together right up till that level, so when that sequencer comes in, the song suddenly doesn't go whang or slow right down. So that's an extra special challenge in the show too, is that when I'm not playing to a click, there still are those constraints that at a certain point in the song, suddenly this bit of perfect tempo is going to come in and I'd better be ready for it, you know. And, and again, from the other guys too, whoever triggers that thing has to trigger it at exactly the right time so that it doesn't upset the tempo and the flow of the song. So there's one part in this song where I'm wired into Getty's keyboard set up and this little DAWs pad here, that's its function. It's, it's the voice of the keyboards. So in places where I can help them out and I can see they're having trouble juggling it all, I say, give me that part, I can play that. And uh, in this part we have a part, um, we call it Event City, and basically it's all, uh, it's a series of sound effects that were put together over the course of a day in a studio. It's not even playable live, and you'll hear it as it goes through the song. That it's another thing that I have to play it exactly in the right time, stay in time with it through a seven uh, seven four section, and then come out of it on time, still in time with the click track of the film and all that. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on that's uh, only driving my mind crazy, and hopefully just keeping the song together. So we'll get going with that one.
all the variables you have to deal with in a song that's... Uh, I say most of our songs are free from click rating. We have two where other people's voices are involved, so we stay in sync with it. But through all that, other people are, are triggering sequencers through there, and the one I mentioned from the keyboards. If I don't nail that on time through that seven section, then, you know, the train wreck happens. We had a couple times on this tour uh, when I, it has to happen to everybody, and I know it does. Even, even Buddy Rich, I know it happened to. That the whole band just... That's the guys out on the soundboard will be making this. Here comes the train. <laughs> so there are infinite opportunities. It's one of the things that does make the show uh, such a case of stress. And before it comes up, it's like what's in your mind is all the things that can go wrong and uh, all the things, too, that are outside of your control because there's so much of it is technology. And even mechanical things, if a snare head breaks at the wrong time, it can be you know, an absolute nightmare. Uh, the next one I was going to go on to is one called Bravado from the new album. It's interesting, I think, because it's, it's basically fundament, um, founded upon a, a four-on-the-floor bass drum rhythm, which is one thing, like, I think a lot of drummers... I used to be leery of, you know, I used to think, I'm not going to sit there and play a four-on-the-floor bass drum beat for all day. And uh, especially in the 70s when it was sort of uh, symptomatic of disco, it was like, it was poison even by association. But over the years, I have found interesting ways to apply it, and the thing that it does do beautifully is that it roots a rhythm and allows your hands to go all kinds of different places and this song I spent a lot of time refining down a drum part that I think is almost architectural it supports the song in different ways dynamics come in and out of it it gave me a great opportunity to use having a floor tom on my left as you'll see both rhythmically and as a, a jumping off point for fills and it's another one too in which uh, sequencers come in and out in perfect time so it's another one where I have to nail the tempo from the beginning and parts of the, the sequencers go away for minutes at a time and then suddenly they're back in so I have to keep the song rooted through the whole space of it and then at the end of it there's an entire uh, improvised section that we added to the recorded version uh, in the rehearsal room and we decided that after all these years we've learned how to reproduce our records live which for a long time was a goal and we've taken criticism for it but I, I think it was a noble thing to try to reproduce what is actually a superhuman performance in the studio you can make it perfect you can correct all your mistakes if there's a little bit you don't like you can go out and fix that little bit you know it, it is truly and literally superhuman so uh, we pursued for probably 16 years just that goal of trying to be as good live as we were on record and we felt that we more or less achieved that to our satisfaction so this tour we immediately started changing our goals and uh, even the new songs we right from day one of rehearsals we started changing arrangements we have to drown this guy out we started changing arrangements adding improvised bits and so on This song's an example like, of that, where the whole end part uh, evolved out of uh, rehearsal room rehearsals, or rehearsal room jams, basically. But then we found out when we came into a venue like this, suddenly the intimacy, both personally and musically among us, was kind of lost. And in arena particularly, it was awfully difficult for us to feel truly free uh, in an impro improvisational sense. So we found that all these patterns and ideas that we developed in the rehearsal room served as well as a foundation but the chances I would take in the rehearsal room obviously are much greater than the ones I would take in, in front of an audience. And I think um, that's a safe enough bet. In fact, I had an interesting conversation about that with Mickey Hart. I went to my first Grateful Dead show in, in Atlanta early in this tour, and uh, he was telling me, he said, the last night they'd had an absolutely great show, and, and that night's one, he felt, was pretty boring because their show is so much predicated on improvisation, as is so much jazz, that as, as human nature and human behavior is, it, it has to range from the ridiculous to the sublime. Some nights it's going to be brilliant, like any of us, and other nights it's going to be really lousy, like any of us. So uh, that's, that's also the weakness of improvisation, so it's a reason why we like to keep our show well balanced in favor of organization, so it will always be at least good. And if we're having an extra special night, there is room, and there are jumping off points where each of us, and collectively, we can now take it further if it's happening. But uh, I thought it was interesting for Mickey to admit that, that you know, some nights they had a brilliant night, and other nights he felt you know, and admitted that uh, it was pretty lame. I'll go on with the uh, bravado. electronics in this too is a big relief.
just an example of what can be done with balanced dynamics, and I think beginning with a song where the other two presented me the song basically with a four-on-the-floor drum machine. And like I said, I've never found that totally satisfying, but it does represent a good jumping-off point. And I found things like the skip drum beat and the drum, uh, bass drum beat in the second verse and ways to bring in the toms in and out for dynamic sake and also to give me more rhythmic variation. And also, from a drummer's point of view, if you're going to play the song possibly for years and years, I think that the drum part becomes important to me because it has to be challenging enough and enjoyable enough to play every night on, uh, you know, on, on an ongoing basis. So it possibly is a different set of values for a studio musician where the only question is serving the song. And, and I think that's valid, too, within its context. But if you're a member of a band that's a touring band, and this is your drum part, and, and essentially your song that you're going to have to reproduce, then I think your agenda becomes that plus. You know, you want to serve the song, certainly. And I think in this case, I was very careful to stay out of the way of vocals or, uh, or uh, lead parts or anything else where I might, you know, sort of tread on someone else's toes. But at the same time, there was no reason not to make it as interesting as possible for me, as dynamic as possible, just as a pure drum part and uh, in the end come up with something that is a pleasure to play every night. Uh, what do we got, that's big money? All the bones, okay. Here's another one that's uh, live is played also to the click for the same reason we have another voice comes up, comes up on the screen up there, so I have to stay in, in sync with the film throughout. Um, I dug myself some interesting holes in the drum part of this. Again, when the guys were working on the musical part, they asked me for some rhythmic input, uh, so I programmed the drum machine because normally in our working relationship, I'm off working on lyrics and they're working on music, so I can't be there, fortunately in a way, because for a drummer I think it's kind of soul-destroying to have to sit there and do the hack work while the other guys are working on a musical part. You're the drum machine, essentially, so I'm, I'm kind of grateful to drum, mach drum machines for taking that away. But in this case, I programmed a drum part for them, and then they wrote the song around this part, which appears in the bridge, and... Uh, I programmed it as a drum machine part, not thinking about having to play it. So when it came to uh, me playing the song physically, of course, I treated that part a little different. And they said, well, that doesn't sound like the part you put. Well, well I can't play that part. You know, it's a drum machine part. A machine can play it. So those kind of challenges, I think, for a lot of us, and certainly for me, all I need is a challenge like that. I will play it. So I went off to the rehearsal room and learned how to play it, and, uh, and it appears in the bridge sections of this song. It's got a very rapid, syncopated sort of bass drum part that... Uh, it was easy for the machine, but considerably more difficult for me. It's Stuff like that you hear through the song. So, again, it was just one of those places where you can, your imagination can sometimes uh, give your body a challenge, or a machine can certainly return that challenge to you. This was an example of that. Uh, electronically in this, through the sections, it's kind of a... A pseudo rap part, we call it the chat, and uh, I use electronic drums just for the the um, kind of veracity, I guess, of it. And it's your typical uh, mechanical drums. Only, of course, I'm playing them physically, and they appear in the middle of a very organic rock song. And this is another case where I'm tapped into the keyboards, um, filling in a part that was difficult for the other two guys to get to. I have to get, again, that was another thing I had to choreograph in the middle of all my playing to get over to that. And then I have another keyboard part here, which again was choreographed in, and I thought, okay, I can get to that, guys. You know, you got enough to do. I'll take over that. So I took on the keyboard part there. I think, yeah, that's all the electronic stuff. So here it is, roll the bones.
trust of technology, like I say, by the time those two are gone, it's like, yes, okay. From now on, I run the show. And not, not at the mercy of, uh, you know, a mechanical feed from elsewhere. Uh, the next one is, again, an older song. It's called The Big Money, but it makes some uh, interesting use of pads available all around me. And one with... Um, couple little sequencers coming in, but for the most part, again, I'm steering the show. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all to say on that one. I'll just, I'll just do it. Oh, here's an interesting choreographic move, too, is uh, snare comes on and off. Snare strands have to come on and off throughout the song, so there are places where I've choreographed a left-hand swing, and one reason why it's so hard for me to switch from this old slingerland because it has the handiest, smoothest, smoothest snare action where I can I can catch it on the way by and switch it on and off and uh, not have to... Guys, I need an extra bar in this song so I can turn the snare on or off. You know, I find that with a lot of strainers, so it's one reason that's kept me with this. Uh, apart from loving its uh, power and sensitivity, it's one thing that the snare strainer, as old as it is, and it's one thing that drives Larry nuts is trying to find parts for a thing that hasn't been made for... Um, you know, 10 years or so, and the, the snare drum I bought secondhand for $60 in about 1976 or something. So, keeping parts for it is difficult, but it's one of those challenges. from my uh, bongo hey, from my uh, my first time ever playing bongos on record so a lot of the samples I have are actually stuff of my own but wouldn't fit in drum kit or wouldn't be practical to get to this is an example of that one. bongo there and down there is uh, from the old days of the Simmons clap trap um, an analog synthesizer where you can just create white noise basically and I use it like a studio engineer would use an effect behind the snare usually hitting both both that one so it's just like an echo in here working with the producer Peter Collins who couldn't stand the sound of Simmons drums so we looked for ways to get the tone and this started as a Simmons drum and then I vocalized the actual sound I wanted I said well I'm looking for sound so, like, doo, doo. so I said okay we'll record that and they recorded it, sampled it and combined it with the tom sound so it's an actual case of my voice in there and then we wanted a percussive effect that was jingling coins so English coins being so huge just took a handful of coins sampled them and used them well, anything else over there? no, I don't, there's no keyboards in that so... Okay, that's the basic round of electronics that are coming into it. Ready now?
another example, too, of uh, a four on the floor not being a limitation, but rather being a foundation where I'm able to keep that going and consequently get from there over to here without losing the tempo things, without losing the flow of things. Um, okay, I guess we might as well come around. Prepare to come about. Don't try this at home. <laughs> so essentially, uh, I mentioned before that I was a little bit reluctant with electronics, and I've talked about it in print and stuff before, so I won't go over it too much again. Just saying that uh, I, could, I didn't go with electronics till I could no longer resist it, basically. When it became possible for me to have every percussion instrument I own, and even ones I've never even seen before as samples, um, I, could, I couldn't say no any longer, so I started adding them, but at the same time I wasn't willing to sacrifice even one acoustic drum, because that, that's the fundamental thing after all. These other things make nice accessories, and they make it possible to have a drum set I can reach that includes marimba, and that includes gongs, and that includes African drums, uh, includes tablas, and every other thing I could possibly want, really, but I can still get at it. So for that reason, I just said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And as we came into sampling, now we're using the uh, Akai samplers, and the Roland samplers offstage are the ones that I'm triggering keyboard-wise. Uh, what I'm going to run through now is basically the opening of uh, my drum solo, which began as a marimba piece. Usually when we're in the studio uh, writing and rehearsing, I like to dabble in something else, and marimba makes a great escape from both lyric writing and for drumming. So a lot of times I'll get a small synthesizer and just create a sequence of chord patterns that I like or that I find challenging or whatever, and I'll make this sequence and then I'll have my marimba in there or the cat mini marimba and just when I get too much brain fever from staring at the computer screen or from working on drum parts, I go and play along with that. So this came out of a piece called Momo's Dance Party that was um, all sequence drums and sequence keyboards and everything, and then the marimba part was played over it live. And in this case, I decided um, I, still didn't, I still am not willing to take the step into using a sequencer live uh, even in a drum solo context, so I thought, okay, I'm going to have to make the best real-time situation combining all these that I can. So it's a combination of uh, basically Latin and uh, African drums over here. My, my actually timbali, actually my timbali had to get jettisoned to put this floor tom here, so it lives on in sound. And then uh, over here we have a combination of congas and uh, um, bongos, which actually survived from a song of ours called Scars, where uh, I made up a whole drum part made of samples. And this one is one of those ones, ones I mentioned. It's called a djembe. I have no idea what it looks like, but I love the sound. And this one is uh, uh, the deep kind of root of the thing in, in an African rhythm, what would be the, the one, basically. And then combined with acoustic, uh, sometimes acoustic snare bass drum, hi-hat, and then I also have that, that's this very snare sampled. Um, out of a song of ours called Grand Designs. It was done for the purposes of, of the song Scars because I had a full, I had my hands full basically playing all the conga and uh, bongo parts and so on. So I, when I wanted to bring the snare in to kick the backbeat in for uh, extra emphasis, I put it down there for that. And I found it quite useful in this context that when I get over onto the marimba, uh, it, it gives me a snare and bass drum, uh, basically a rhythmic continuity allowing it. There's another place too where the sound man's helping me out because. Um, in the beginning of it, I wanted something that was quite atmospheric that would allow me to build a drum solo basically from um, an arrhythmic sense. So I would just start with sounds and moods and set up the tribal sort of uh, basic mood. And in a way, I construct a drum solo partly as an autobiography of all the things that have interested me in drumming over the years, and also partly in an unpretentious way, but as a history too of, um, of drumming as it has evolved and as I've learned it. So I thought I wanted to start with this very tribal thing and have it be arrhythmic at first and then gradually bring rhythm, rhythm into it and then gradually bring melody into it um, and then as the drum solo evolved throughout it went into uh, all the evolutions of marching drumming and uh, a taste of jazz drumming here and there and different ideas of rock drumming and, and Caribbean drumming, reggae drumming and so on. So I'm basically I'm going to play the intro for you and then we'll spin around and I'll get on to the outro uh, and leave out all the flash stuff in the middle. But um, Basically, the sound man is covering me here where I've got just a... I begin with just that, and then through the house, in an arena, for instance, we would have a quad system, so he sends that around around the house, when she sits around the house. So uh, the sound man's covering for me there, and uh, I can just... I can build up my little fills, as I'll demonstrate in a second, and then gradually evolve it into uh, a complete rhythm, and then develop that rhythm, and then bring melody into it. So I'm beginning, basically, as... As I get introduced, I'm starting just with the chimes here and then.
just kind of filling in as we go around and then I get into the uh, real drum stuff. And basically stay front, back forth a little bit onto the marimba, tom things, snare things, all that kind of stuff. And then the big wind up is um, uh, basically big band samples, which um, came, the inspiration came from Count Basie record and then I ended up making my own samples because I felt kind of guilty about stealing people's sounds. So uh, I went into a studio and got a um, sync clavier and uh, reproduced the tonalities that I was interested in, created the chords that I wanted, and then assigned them around the pads here and here and here, all in different uh, pitches, so that I could create basically a musical piece as the culmination of the solo. Is that? So basically I come to and then... supposed to be on there. The snare got shut off, but uh, that's essentially the thing. Oh, this little drum I wanted to talk about. It's Mickey Hart turned me on to this. He had one of those going, and where I was watching them, I was sitting behind, and I kept seeing him coming over and using this as, as a downbeat. And I thought it was a sample at first, but then I noticed he was doing the, he was doing these little slurs on a kind of a 6-8 thing, and I thought, I've never heard a pad with that kind of sensitivity. And when I was asking about it, he told me, Remo, I guess, some of you may know, all, you, all of you may know, but it was news to me. This drum is so tight, you cannot even depress the head. It's got a Kevlar, woven Kevlar head in it that's super strong, and then the snares are exactly under the head. So it's, uh, it was invented, I think, for parade drum use. Beautiful sensitivity on it, um, and also just makes a nice little acoustic sound rather than a sampled one that uh, I think in future I would be tempted to use as a counterpoint to the snare or uh, it just makes a great percussive thing. It, uh, Getty mentioned it sounds like firecrackers going off. And uh, that was the interesting thing that I've run to. And, it, and it's nice too, in the middle of a tour, we've been out for eight months now, so it's nice to have some, a new sound you know, to play with and, uh, and just to add something to it. I guess basically that's all I, I want to say uh, formally. Any questions? Yeah. Go. Uh, when you're doing fast 16ths, like at the beginning of Tom Sawyer, what kind of technique are you using on your hand? Doing fast. The 16th, oh, the I see. Um, thumb forefinger is the firm grip, and then uh, a lot of times it'll be fingers. Fingers. Uh, same with um, rudimental stuff. I, I know a lot of drummers use that. A very strong uh, grip. A lot of times the stick is held firmly, but when you want small stuff with great control, you can get it uh, between your fingers there and use your fingers and your wrist almost against each other. Uh, I'm honestly not sure if that's what I'm doing there, but I'm, I'm guessing. Fingers are off a bit, so uh, the fingers, it's like essentially your grip, but sometimes when you need extra speed, you can open up a bit and use your fingers either just as a fulcrum point or to increase the, uh, the speed of the wrist. Yeah? Do you feel that in the earlier days of Rush, when you first started out, after Fly By Night, A Crest of Steel was my album. I mean, that's what started me. Thank you all. I, I, <laughs> I have to give it to you that you're the reason that I'm playing drums now. But do you feel you have more or less artistic freedom? I don't know whether it's because of the record companies or whatever. Oh, but more, no question about it. Press the turning. What's that? Uh, we have had more for a long time. At that point, we had to fight for every bit of it because we weren't paying our own way, frankly. We were still existing on 
fortunately we had a record company who didn't pay too much attention to what was going on and we were lucky we had four albums that didn't three albums basically that didn't do that well and didn't do any better than the previous ones and we slipped by where today you wouldn't a band that got signed if, if by an album or two they didn't start showing some expanding audience they wouldn't survive we slipped through the cracks 2112 was the one for us that was big enough that we became self-sufficient and from that day forward we didn't have to fight anymore up to that point it, it was like saying oh you're not going to make us an album with a song a whole you know a song a whole side long well yes we are no you can't well yes we can <laughs> you know they try no one can tell you what to do and yeah it's insane it's an insane record but we certainly we yeah Oh, to the contrary. No, to the contrary. They, they were quite adamantly against it, and the whole business side of things will be. But you have the choice. I mean, no one can make you do it. That's why I don't like hearing... Uh, sometimes you hear an interview with a musician, and they say, well, we had the record made the way we liked it, and then the record company came in and said, change it. Well, they can't make you. You know, you can say no. You can always say no. And that's, that's the lesson that I found a lot of bands don't learn, is how to, when to say no. When you're working too hard, when people are exerting on pres pressure on you that they have no right to, no one has, has the right to tell you how to mold your music. Their business is to sell it. You know, I, I think music and business, there ought to be a mile-long ditch between them. And, and I, I personally observe that ditch, and I don't get involved in the business side of things. And I don't expect them to be in the recording studio. I don't expect to be, them to be there when I'm writing songs or working on drum parts or whatever. It's a big division, but it is a freedom that's, that has to be earned. You know? And for us, we had to earn the right to have them leave us alone. Well, it's the same now, but... Like I say, it, it, it wasn't easy then. Now no one has the right to say anything, and no one would. You know, In this case, we have been successful over all these years, so no one's going to try and tell us what to do, or if they are, they're going to be pretty stupid. No, not at all. No, a lot of people would like to think so, but no, if you're brave, it just takes courage. You know, to stand up and say, no, we're doing it this way, you know. This is what I wanted to do, and, and I'm not afraid to get another job, too. You know, but it's a moral point that every musician has to answer for uh, for him or herself. And I, I grew up with people that, for them, all they cared about was making a living playing music. It didn't matter if they played polkas, country music, Broadway shows. They, they did not care. As long as, to them, the point of honor was, I'm making a living playing drums. To me, I didn't understand that, but that's my set of values. To me, I want to play the music I like, and if I have to, I'll work in the daytime at another job and play bars, or I'll be in a band that just plays in the basement. You know, that was my point of honor, but it's different for different people, and you can't judge. I think actually the actual inspiration, I'm the first one to admit that nearly everything I do comes from somewhere else, from some other drummer, from some other style of music. In that case, it was uh, probably around Japan's Tin Drum album. He, the, their drummer, um, Steve Jensen, used to play a lot of that style with Tom Thompson, just alternating to the snare as alternative to the backbeat. So it was the kind of thing where I would never imitate what somebody does, but I would go... I would think to myself, that's a really cool way to create an alternative that keeps the flow of the rhythm going, but so you're not going, you know, all through every part of every song. So I think around that time there were a lot of drummers, actually Roxy Music too around that time, were doing a lot of things with toms rather than, uh, what, than snare. And it was a kind of thing that was going around that I caught on to and, and found ways to use myself. Yeah, when you're in the studio and they're recording, do you think about the fact that you have to reproduce it live, or do you do it... Yeah. Yeah, I do. Some people don't, and they're quite happy to go in and do anything. I have a problem with overdubs for that reason, because I'm going to miss it so much live. Yeah. So I'm very tempted sometimes. I love playing hand drums, I love playing congas and bongos, but um, if you put them on, they're either not going to be there live, or they have to be there live artificially. So, again, that's a value judgment that any, any musician, drummer or not, has to make, whether you want it to be reproducible. For me, I find it frustrating to play something that's not going to be there live. And because we play live so much... And that's another factor, too, for a lot of drummers, if you're doing sessions. And that, what does it matter? You're not going to be playing it live, or if you are, it's going to be, you know, there'll be a percussionist there to cover for you or whatever. So that's the choice I've made for myself, that I want to be able to play it live, and I'll find a way to get bongo parts and whenever.
whatever I have overdubbed them or something, I'll find a way somehow to play it. You know, I'll ignore another hi hat part and play the bongo part or something like that. I'll get back over here, yeah. What was your? Uh, you say when you record uh, your albums, you have a lot of freedom. Um, what was your relationship with Peter Collins as far as producer of the band? Was it? Did you have? Did he control? What was? His, his role? I don't know, of we always. It's strictly speaking, a co-producer, and that's a semantic. Um, distinction but it's a very important one it's produced by us and peter collins or whoever um just to protect that uh, autonomy and the and the fact that we have the final say but we usually choose someone contrary to us there would no there would be no sense us choosing another rock producer we chose him because most of his work was in pop music but he had a lot of he had a great feel for melody and song structure ideas for things that we'd never done about orchestration and using choirs and all this stuff so um but mostly we're, okay, we want a guy that sits back and just listens to the song. Between ourselves and the engineer, we know how to get a good drum sound. We know how to judge a performance and make sure that it's the performance that we want. So with uh, Peter Collins on those two records and Rupert Hine on the two most recent, they've been song guys, both of them with a very strong musical sense, and they don't get involved with all the techniques. They just leave it. You know, If we're messing with a drum sound or a guitar sound or something, they walk away, and then they come back and listen to the song as a whole. Um, it's never a question of control, and if it ever came to a veto situation, we would have it, but we... I don't think we've ever had to use it. You know, it'd be a case where we would trust his judgment. Obviously, we hire him because we trust his judgment, and we usually give them a bit of a test too, saying that, uh, well, we play them our last record and say, well, what do you think is wrong with it, and what would you have done differently? And that's a very important way of telling what they can contribute. If they can find the flaws that we know are there, and say, well, I would have changed this vocal melody, or I would have set this arrangement up differently, something like that. Those are the valuable things that you want to know. But for the most part, no, they're there to encourage you and to get the best out of you. Uh, a kind of producer that's a boss, I think I would have to probably kill. <laughs> I don't take orders well. It's one reason why I have to be in a band as opposed to being, you know, sort of a hired gun type drummer because I'm, I love working with people. I would never want to be a solo artist. I love working in a musical collaboration. But it has to be a collaboration. I don't want to take orders from anybody. Suggestions I love. And in fact, um, when we're working on songwriting and I bring some lyrics into the other guys and they say, well, you know, this is okay, but what about this part maybe could be a little better? It's like, yeah, you're right. You know, it becomes an exciting thing rather than bitterness and why is that guy telling me what to do? It's more like... It, it becomes greater, obviously, a collaboration. So for me, a group situation, I think most solo artists would agree that most ones I've talked to, they wish they were in a group. You know, they see the situation we have creatively, musically, and commercially, and it, it, is, it has to be a musician's dream. We do exactly what we want with people we like, music that satisfies us, and people in a place like this come to see us. So, you know, it's... It, like I say, solo musicians, even successful ones, Billy Joel said, you know, to Getty one time that he wished he was in a rock band like us because it's, it's got to be so lonely just being a solo guy giving the orders as opposed to collaborating on the ideas. So over here we have been, yeah. yeah uh, more of a technique question. Uh, back at home I play a pretty big kit, not quite that size, but uh, like if I'm trying to do like a real fast thing, like roundhouse fill, I tend most of the times I'll end up like clicking, like uh, you know, on the side of the drums somewhere along the way. Right. Like, when you first started playing, like, how did you go about like the stick control, you know? Like, I try to hit that six inch tom if I was <laughs> I think the eyes, the eyes closed exercise is a good one. You know, it's one thing that uh, Larry and I go through with the setup. Um, he's got it down so well now that we never have to change a thing, but probably for the first 10 years, I would come in and, and one day something just wouldn't be quite the angle it should be. And really, I, have, I think I should be able to play with my eyes closed. It's easier if you can look at them, but... Um, it, it's a great way to practice, too. A lot of times if I'm trying to work on something, your eyes close anyway in concentration, and you find that the drums do fall under you, and it's, a, it's messing with your setup, too. It should be a natural reach, in other words. I, I'm not overextending myself for any of these things, and we mess around with where the stands are going to go and change the stands sometimes to get everything in a very natural attitude. The marimba is really hard to get just right because it has to be focused a bit towards me but out of the way of the other things. I mean, all those things are just fine-tuning your setup, and, and I think, honestly, it sounds dumb, but practice with your eyes closed is probably a really good idea. Uh, not necessarily fast either. I mean, it's, it's a fundamental truism of all rehearsal to start slow and build it up, you know, and it's certainly for, for trying to get between drums and all that. Yeah, because you're, and getting your left hand active too is one reason I like having drums over here because if you're a right handed drummer, your, your left hand tends to be, you know, a bit sta sta uh, stagnant, and it's hard to get it to want to move around to all these things. So I would make an effort to put a drum over there that I needed and, and have to get over to it, you know. Yeah. I don't remember all your phrasings. Yeah, I don't know. There's a, a kind of a mental thought process that... Um, 
that leads one to another, and plus they are kind of, they're constructed that way. So one phrase, for instance, in a first verse will suggest one in the second verse, and it'll be an expansion of them, so that leads me along the right path. I'll know that this fill is, is an intimation of the one that's coming next. I tend to build a song that way anyway, just in, in a very architectural way where the first verse might be the foundation and uh, the next one will be an echo of that with a little embellishment to it. So I think there's a language, I talked about this with a drummer one time, a drummer friend of mine, we were trying to describe the drummer's language because you don't see things in notes necessarily or in, it's almost for me in pictures. I, I picture a certain fill or a certain figure and it has a symbol in my head, it's like hieroglyphics. There's a symbolic language I think a drummer can learn that's beyond notation. So when I, even on a long, complicated drum part, or for us, two, over two hours of a live show, there is. So it's a subverbal language. You just learn like another language, you know, and it comes together over time. So it's not a mental. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely mental, but all mental thinking, I think, is dimensional. You know, it, and uh, I was reading something Carl Jung or somebody recently about three-dimensional thoughts, how you picture things in, in three dimensions, and be, that's why your brain can hold so much because it's not two-dimensional; it's three-dimensional. So, when the symbolic language and hieroglyphics that that bring a drum pattern together, or, or help you memorize a poem, or uh, you know, for a reporter to remember the facts at the scene of the crime, or whatever, there's a dimensional hierarchy of things that trigger each other. And a friend of mine has a theory that they, you can only have six things in your brain at a time, and I happen to think that's true in the forefront of your brain. There can only be a handful of things, but each of them can trigger back like, like a computer does. You know, you can go back in hypercard, one thing triggers another bank of knowledge, triggers another one, so you can go, um, you know, deeper into the dimensional memory. Is that, that a way. conscious, subconscious difference? Or? Um, for anyone who's read Carl Jung, yeah, I would put it in, in the unconscious realm that's readily available to the conscious mind. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. Well, I think beyond a certain level, I mean, for me, 25 years down the line, uh, playing is the best practice. And I play, you know, over two hours in the show, plus sound checks on so nearly three hours a day. I have a little practice kit in the dressing room that I've been using lately uh, just to play around with new ideas and that stuff. So, uh, to the contrary, I think I play to, in front of an audience, you're going to play at an extreme level that you would never do in a practice room because it hurts. rehearsing or practicing, I'll go till it hurts and then I'll stop, but in front of an audience you can't, you know, if it starts to hurt, if you get a cramp, or if you cut your finger, any of those things, you have, your, you know, willpower has to take you beyond those things and discipline demands it, so I play at a much greater level live, and in fact that's why I rehearse, when I'm rehearsing for a tour I play to the records, because that's me at a superhuman level, that's better than I can really play, so if I work, if I try to rehearse to that level, it drives me to the level that I'll need for a, a live performance, but if you feel the, the expectation from an audience that even if you don't feel well, even if something hurts, even if you're not having a great night, you know, you have to, you have to push it out. It's just like a, a responsibility, I think, that you just feel night after night. how to do everything. You said in your last Modern Drummer article that you were finally confident in your playing. I'm sorry? You said in your, in your last Modern Drummer article that you were finally confident in your right. playing. Uh, my question is, when you play, are you, when you're using you know, rhythms or paradiddles, whatever, are you still thinking paradiddle, paradiddle? Or no, it gets into that language thing I was talking about before, that I just know what, what button to push that'll take me to the thing I need to get to. And uh, same with counting. I almost never need to count anymore because it becomes a cycle, and as we discussed, one thing sets up the next thing, so I'm constantly aware of where I am within the arrangement of the song um, and what's coming. I've, I've talked again with other drummers about this, and you can't be thinking about what you're playing right now. I think anyone would agree with that. It's a fundamental thing that if you're thinking about what you're playing right now, then you're going to fall apart in the next phrase, you know? So for me, I'm playing where I am, and, and I'm at least um, probably four bars ahead 
in my brain, setting myself up physically. Again, with a wide kit where your, your fulcrum and, and your point of balance is changing, it's most important to be rooted. And if I change from being in the hi-hat to the ride cymbal, I have to set up my shift of balance. If I come over to these pads or over to the marimba, I'm way out of balance. So I have to set myself up a long time in advance to get to those things. So there's a train of thought, I would say, that's, that's probably about 20 to 30 seconds ahead of where I am. So you have to have the confidence of, of what you're doing right now. You thought about that 30 seconds ago, so it's going to be okay. And be thinking ahead to the next transition, to the next change, especially when you get down to small points of tempo, when you want smoothness in and out of a fill, and when you're dealing with sequencers or playing to a click or something, um, not only is it desirable, it's absolutely necessary that you have that, that smoothness. And so, therefore, it's necessary to set yourself up so far in advance. I just, sorry, I just want to check out your time. The second one I did today, Bravado, was an example of that where um, I, I've seemed to have found a pattern for myself anyways that it takes three days of solid work to develop a set of lyrics, to develop a, a drum pattern, because you have to re-examine what you've done all the time, and it's necessary to get away from it and come back. And when I was rehearsing for the album this time, uh, I had a, a couple of weeks just for myself, so I had a work tape, and I'd spend a couple of hours on each song, and then I'd know I'd done as much as I could, and I'd go on to another song. The next day, go through the cycle again, and every time I'd find a new detail or um, a new bit of, or if I could punch up the rhythm of the vocals or, or little things like that that make it so satisfying, or a new rhythmic approach to something, but some of them are really hard. If you're trying to stay out of a cliche, um, some songs just drive me crazy, and, and day after day I'll think I'm getting nowhere with this, it doesn't feel good, I, I don't like playing it, there's something wrong with the song, you know, but by the third day, um, something comes together, and I find the same with lyrics. I'll sit there for two days in front of lyrics going, this is awful, I hate it, why don't I just burn it and go home? But by the third day, all of that starts to come together, and I go, oh yeah. And same with the drum part, too. I'll sit there and slave over it, slave over it, thinking so depressed and so down on myself, and then finally the key, or finally just the confidence comes, and I play it all together and go, yeah. So uh, in answer to that, it, it, bit by bit it comes together. I start out with possibilities. Pardon? I'll play to a demo tape of it, and I usually like to work without the other guys, because, again, I mentioned before, I don't like being the drum machine for them, and I don't like the feeling that they're slaving for me. So I get them to make me a work tape of the song just to a drum machine or something, and then as I play along with it, I try all the possibilities. Because again, I think I've written about this before, two ways to approach learning a song. Start from the minimalist point of view of the very smallest possible thing you can do, or the maximalist. Play, I'll, the first time through, I'll play everything that can possibly fit in that rhythm. I'll try everything, and it'll sound chaotic, um, but I'll gradually eliminate. Okay, this works, but it doesn't really do anything, so I'll throw that out. This works, and it can take me somewhere, and I can multiply it or subtract from it and all this. For me, I start with everything and then subtract. Some drummers would start with, the, with one beat and then add to it slowly. Whatever works for you, I would say. judged by most recent work for it, so to me the whole Roll the Bones album represents me today and what I think, you know, so I don't know about that. They're doing it on purpose. Good point, good point. And one thing that I really was careful of with this album, that I wanted to be very precisely arranged in all the drum parts and work them out, but spontaneity is important too, and I learned to trick myself into being spontaneous, and that a song uh, like Bravado or Roll the Bones, I worked out pretty well the whole song. And I would always leave a part 
but I wouldn't let myself work out. And every time I came to it, I would make my mind go blank, and whatever happened, happened. Because there is a special edge to something that's never been played before, that way or whatever. So when I came into the studio... into the studio knowing the song really well so I'd be able to get a good performance of it rapidly but at the same time I was at such a pitch of concentration and excitement that when I came to the improvised parts the spontaneous parts that had never been done that way they would come out accurate but there would be an ex extra edge to them just something just uh, you would never get no, no other listener would ever pick it up but me but I think there's an intangible excitement that it adds to it it's, it can never be over rehearsed that way it can never be too pat and you know too precise because this thing this part of the song this transition this drum fill never happened that way before so I think you can have both I think you can work it out so that you know that drum part so well that you can record it in a snap really well and at the same time go for something extra special that's never happened before so I think I better take two more questions there's a bunch of guys have work to do up here so I'll take two more yeah I was wondering, uh, you did a collaboration with a band called Max Webster. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you were, uh, if you've done anything else besides, I think this tune is called Battle Stars. Right, yeah. A lot of little things along the way, mostly on a friendly basis, though. We are so satisfied by what we get to do. Every style of drumming I like to play, I get to play. Um, I did a thing a month ago just doing hand drums with a, a, a band that I'm friends with in Toronto and just came in and did some bongos and did some cowbells and tambourine and that kind of stuff. But it's basically just to work with friends rather than a musical compulsion. None of us needs a solo album because every record is each of our solo albums, really. So, uh, and, and each of us have done those kind of things with helping out a band or working with friends or something like that, but very informally and, and on a very small scale. Mostly. Don't have much time either. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we've been on tour for eight months now, and we're in the studio for six months before that. So, we're we're pretty busy just on this thing. Hey, one last one. Where haven't I been yet? Uh, yeah, down here. What sort of education have you had as far as drums, everything, lyrical? Um, Drumming, I had an excellent teacher that started me off, and I think that's the irreplaceable magic touch. I went in, I, he only, he quit teaching after about 18 months, but he, in that 18 months he gave me the best grounding of the directions that I needed to go. He gave me a great set of values of what a good drummer should be able to do and how high you should aim in terms of perfection and technique. I think in my first drum lesson he played me uh, the drum battle, the famous Buddy Rich Dean Krupa one. He said, right, here's where we're going. And then he picked up the sticks and showed me how to hold them and says, here's how we're going to get there. Uh, but most importantly, after about six or eight months, he, had the, he gave me the piece of encouragement that I needed. You know, I've been working on all this stuff and learning how to read, learning my rudiments and all the stuff that you need to start with. But at about the six-month point, he told me that if I worked at it, I would be a drummer. And it was like, that's all I needed to hear. You know, I'd never found anything up to that time. I'd never been good in sports or anything else particularly. So that was like the spark. And then from when he quit teaching, I tried a few other teachers and the magic wasn't there so I went to the radio and I went to other drummers on record and just started learning that way or going to see people and self-taught in a sense but there's a beautiful quote that the man who says he's self-taught has been taught by a fool because you don't learn from yourself you learn from other drummers you know and you learn from music and I, I happened to think at the time the best way to learn was playing along with the radio because I had no choice it wasn't like a lot of people put on their favorite record and drum along with it I think that's kind of limiting. I would put on Top 40 radio and I would have to play to every song that came on, however stupid it was, however much I hated it, however lame the drum part was. But I learned a flexibility and a tolerance for different styles and I think an adaptability too, just from a little plastic AM radio. So those are kind of things that are special. Uh, in formal education, the same sort of thing happened. As soon as I found these things, nothing else existed. So I got out of school, but then went on to become self-taught through you know, doing a lot of reading and, and making friends who were uh, educated in different areas and learning from them and so on so uh, yeah no, that, that's purely a joke came open eyes and open ears I think is the, the best school room uh, I'm gonna have to let these guys get, guys get to work thanks a lot for coming out I hope you got something out
All right. So go ahead, and you're talking to him. And let's see. I'm talking to. You're talking to him also. Okay. Okay, we're ready and rolling. So what did you think of the uh, Neil Pert Clinic at the Irvine Meadows? Oh, man, it was great, you know. I mean, for me it's like kind of historic day because he was kind of my idol. And I come from so far away, Argentina, you know, and I never guess, you know, it's kind of opportunity. So him, you know, a couple, I don't know, <laughs> just, you know, playing, you know, he's like a genius. He's in, I don't know, other kind of level, you know. His personality, he's perfect, you know. So it was, it's kind of, it was great to be here, you know. It's, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> Speechless. Switch sides with me and do one more question. Anything you would, anything you think anybody would want to understand, right? Uh, what do you think of his drum kit? So a kid, you know, looks, I mean, original, you know, but I suppose he plays with a bigger drums and bigger toms, but it's, I don't know, very strange, you know, it's kind of electronic scenes, very particular, I mean, I think he, he shows his personality, you know, over the drum set and it's great, you know. Great. Awesome. Okay. If you get interviewed, stand right over here behind Johnny. We'll get